Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us for this quick hit uh, from Complete Intelligence. Uh, today, we're talking about inflation. Uh, it's been on everyone's mind for the last couple months, and we've got two macro geniuses to talk to us about it today. Uh, we've got Nick Glinsman from Evo Capital, and we've got Sam Rines from Avalon. Um, Sam, if you don't mind, could you give us a quick intro introduction of yourself before we get into the details? Sure. Thanks, Tony. I'm Samuel Rines. I'm the Chief Economist with Avalon Advisors in Houston, Texas, uh, where we manage portfolios for ultra high net worth and high net worth clients. Thanks very much. Nick, can you give us a quick quick overview? Yes, um, Nick Linsman. I'm, I'm working with a team of other geniuses and <laughs> we advise hedge funds, funds, politi politicos in terms of macroeconomic and geopolitical. Great. And my background is uh, from the buy side. Great. Okay. And Nick, you're based in Brazil, just so everybody knows kind of where we are geographically. So, Brazil is, I think, is the phrase I would probably use. I can't get out. <laughs> Perfect. So, you know, inflation, we, we look at the lumber market, we look at, you know, copper, we look at a lot of these indicators of inflation. And it's been on everyone's mind over the last few months. You know, a year ago, people were writing about deflation. Now the worry is inflation. Obviously, we've seen a lot of monetary and fiscal policy in the interim. So, um, Nick, can you kind of give us your view on where we are with inflation and what that looks like over what horizon? Is it sure. months? Is it five years? Is, you know, how does this play out? The horizon is a little bit tougher, but my, my thesis is ba based on looking back at historical precedents. And I focused on the LBJ, Vietnam War spending, combined with his great society fiscal spend, which ultimately led in the early 70s, that was the mid 60s, that ultimately led into the early 70s, Paul Volcker. And Paul Volcker is famed for taming huge inflation there was at that period. Uh, and I'm sitting here, having spent the last year, but actually building this thesis up for a couple of years, thinking that the equivalent of the Vietnam expenditure is COVID, and the the relief spending that's been that's combined Trump and now Biden, and then the Great Society equivalent would be Biden's green infrastructure spending, which I slightly tongue in cheek call the Green Gulf Plan, um, which is enormous. And these, you know, when I find myself agreeing with Larry Summers on inflation <laughs> outlook, I, I, I do take note. Um, and I think his odds of a third in terms of this creating inflation, I would suggest a higher. In terms of timeline, it took seven years, five to seven years for the inflation to really kick in during the 60s leading to Volcker. I think this time around it will be much quicker due to the differences, which Great. would include, if I may just one quickly, what would include a lot of globalization um, and the just-in-time supply chain management. Perfect. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much for that. Sam, can you, you have a slightly different view. Um, I actually think it's a dramatically different view. Can you kind of give us your view of where we are in inflation and what's the duration that you kind of expect this to play out? Sure. Let's... I would say I have a very different view, but uh, <laughs> mine, mine would say that, you know, if you look at the lumber market, if you look at copper, et cetera, these are things that tend to sort themselves out rather rapidly, right? Uh, being in Houston, the best cure for high prices and 
energy is high prices. Uh, we will pump more if oil ever goes to 80. It's very similar with lumber. Um, it's very similar with copper. Uh, most of the mills are becoming much more efficient in lumber, uh, for instance. So we will see that begin to roll over and that'll roll over in a very meaningful way as we begin to work through these supply chain issues that uh, we know are coming in the summer and we know are probably going to persist in the fall. Uh, but as we get into the fall and we get into early 2022, even if we have a couple trillion dollars in infrastructure, it's going to be spread over the better part of 10 years. Infrastructure is not a fast spend and it will not save us from the fiscal cliff. It will not save us from the, uh, the lower employment numbers that we've been seeing on an overall basis. Yes, un unemployment is moving lower, uh, but employment is not keeping up with the employment figures. Uh, so once the economy begins to have to stand on its own two legs, even if it has a touch of uh, tailwind from the government, it's still going to be very difficult uh, to continue to see consumption going through the roof, continue to see uh, the types of disruptions that we'll see for the next six to nine months in terms of supply chain that will have one-off uh, price implications. Uh, but that to me says uh, we're probably getting towards the peak of the sugar high as we get into the summer. And the other side of the sugar high is going to be very painful in terms of going back to a one and a half to two and a half percent birth rate in the U.S. Uh, inflation uh, that will be very difficult to get higher uh, simply because it's difficult to have sustained uh, disruptions in supply. Uh, and demographics that aren't changing anytime soon. Uh, so we will continue to have a number of those headwinds. And I think that's what the U.S. tenure is telling you. The U.S. tenure at 1.5 is telling you that the market's looking through this summer and saying the next decade doesn't look as good as the last decade uh, in a lot of ways. So I think there's it's something to at least keep in the back of our minds that the Fed doesn't have great control over the 10 year. The Fed has great control over you know, the zero to two year time frame, but right. not, not the 10 years. That's the thing we're taking. Okay, so let's let's look at common areas. It seems to me that both of you see inflation continuing to rise, maybe not in terms of the rate of rise, but certainly continue to rise through, say, Q3, Q4. Do we at least have common ground there? Okay. Yeah. I'm, yes, absolutely. Okay, good. Um, so, so um, you know, when we look at some of the the pressures in inflation, part of my assertion has been, uh, and I'm sure you're both going to tell me I'm wrong, but uh, as we've seen the CNY strengthen, my uh, hypothesis has been with a strong CNY, um, Chinese manufacturers are stocking up on uh, industrial metals, food, other things, because it's in dollar terms, they can get it pretty cheaply. Um, and, you know, they're waiting for CNY to devalue again when their buying power will decline. So what I'm hearing is that a lot of these things are really going to China to be hoarded. Um, and as kind of a, a play on a potentially devaluing CNY. What do you think of that hypothesis in, you know, aligned with a lot of the central bank easing? Um, is that a valid way of looking at inflation? Meaning this is stockpiling more than it is demand pull. If I can, sorry, I was just about to ask ask you a couple of questions. One, um, my view on China is that if you look at food, firstly, there is a food shortage crisis. And we all know what the CCP are most scared of, which is society unrest. Um, and we could take the examples of the Arab Spring, food is the key. Um, but I also wonder whether the Chinese are stockpiling in anticipation of decoupling. 
Um, you know, I, I think of rare earths, which of which they have a large control of the refining thereof being problematic. Semiconductors, there is an issue there. So if I, if I extrapolate further, I, my view is, and this is where I think I start to diverge from Sam, is I think the supply chain issues are much longer standing now because of various geopolitical forces creating a decoupling with China, for sure. Um, and you have, as we discussed the last time, Tony, we have this Anglosphere grouping that's clearly beginning to take shape which now looks like it will include India because of the health crisis there. If we look at that, then the question is what happens with Europe? Um, I, again, I think that's part of the supply chain problem while, whilst they decide which side they go to. Mm. Is it China-centric or is it Anglosphere centric um, So I think the supply chain issue is much longer standing. Hence, I, I suspect my view is I suspect that we've got China positioning, because not, no, nothing goes on with, in China without the government knowing about it, quite frankly, in terms of anticipating a supply chain issue. Because all the commodities that are importing, they're short of. Mm, okay. It's a natural short. Okay, Sam, first of all, what do you think about my hypothesis and then Nick's uh, kind of qualification around the supply chain issues being much longer ter term on the back of decoupling. Ooh, so I would take the argument that decoupling is in, in action, it's a process, and the process takes a very, very, very long time. Um, and that creates, in in my mind, a much longer time frame for the United States to build out its portion of the supply chain for uh, instance, semiconductors, et cetera. Um, so I, I, I would say, I, I don't disagree that there is a decoupling underway. I just, I, my opinion or my argument would be that it will take much longer um, than a few years uh, to really get that process uh, to move. And it'll be particularly under this administration, a much more diplomatic um, and less blunt force uh, tools uh, than we've seen in the past uh, being used. So I don't disagree with the supply chain eventually being at least somewhat disentangled from China. I would just argue that it will take uh, quite a while uh, to really begin to become an issue uh, unto itself. Uh, on your point, the China stockpiling, that, that it does appear to be happening. It does appear to be uh, a hedge against a weaker CNY to come, uh, including with lumber. Uh, one of the reasons that lumber prices are spiking is because China is buying a lot of lumber in the U.S. So, yeah, I would say that that is a significant problem. Uh, and I would point to when they stop stockpiling, uh, that tends to have a significant effect on the price of commodities in the opposite direction. Uh, we've seen that with copper a couple of times uh, during their infrastructure uh, builds. Uh, the interesting thing right now is you've actually seen a pullback uh, from uh, infrastructure spending uh, from the peak in China. They've begun to do their form of policy tightening on that front already. Suspect it will continue, at least on the margin. Uh, and that will be a significant headwind uh, for those commodities that have been stockpiled when less of them are being used on the margin as well. Uh, so I would that, that does play into a 2022 uh, disinflationary type uh, environment versus 21. OK, so given that we have all of these different pressures, whether it's supply chains, whether it's stockpiling, whatever it is, <clears throat> what the, the people in the middle, so the, the manufacturers, what capacity do they have to absorb these price rises? What are you guys seeing when you talk to people and when you read? Are you seeing that manufacturers can absorb the lumber prices, and the copper prices and other things, or are they passing that directly along?